Uh, yes, we know you can start. Okay, so yeah, welcome everyone to Wireless Business Defense. Why don't we again? Let's get started. So uh, thank you everyone for joining this uh, thesis defense. And the title of the thesis is Secure Multi-Party Computation with Limited Connectivity. Uh, feel free to interrupt whenever uh, to ask any questions at all. Uh, I think I uh, am able to present better if it is slightly more interactive. So let me begin by uh, briefly describing what secure multi-party computation is. We will... Uh, we will abbreviate secure multi-party computation as MPC at different points. Uh, so, uh, so the question that is being addressed in MPC is the following. Can mutually distrusting parties collaborate using their private data? Consider the following situation. Uh, there is a set of parties uh, and they all have their private inputs, let's say X1, X2 and so on. And they want to, they all want to compute some pre-agreed functions that depend on all these inputs. And this needs to be done without any party revealing their input to the rest of the parties. So uh, if uh, they all can agree on a trusted party, then this there is a simple, it's a protocol uh, to realize this. So all the parties privately communicate their inputs to this trusted party. And the trusted party uh, uh, computes the required functions and uh, communicates the output of these function evaluations back to the respective parties. Now the, yeah, like this. Now the, um, uh, the objective of MPC is to remove this dependent, dependence on a trusted party. So we want to come up with protocols that is being run, that will be run by the parties who are interested in this com computation. Uh, and uh, yeah, and ensure that the security that we require is, uh, you know, protected. So, um, so we will say that a uh, multi party communication protocol is secure, or it is a secure uh, multi party computation, if uh, it emulates this uh, ideal setting with the trusted party that I just now described. So what does it mean for a uh, protocol to emulate these, this ideal world implementation with the trusted party? So we want to ensure that the parties involved in the protocol learns nothing more than they would have if they had participated in this ideal world implementation instead of this communication protocol. So, uh, so consider a party uh, taking part in the protocol. Now, if they were uh, part of this ideal implementation, then uh, all that the party sees will be their own input, let's say X on, and the output of the function that they wanted to compute. So we will call what the party sees in a protocol, the view of the party. Now, if we look at the uh, view of the party in the communication protocol, uh, in addition to their input and output to the uh, input and output to the function, the party sees way much more stuff. Like it will have received and sent many messages to all the remaining parties that are involved in the protocol, and it would have flipped some coins and so on. Now, uh, we want to ensure that the party does not learn anything more than what it has learned in the ideal implementation. Now this is formalized by a simulation argument. We will uh, say that uh, the, the view of the party in the protocol carries no extra information because it can actually be simulated with just the input and output of that party in the ideal uh, world. So, uh, <clears throat> so note that we can define security more generally uh, against even a set of parties colluding together. We want to ensure that even the set of parties colluding together does not learn anything more than their own input and outputs together. So this is uh, shown naturally by extending, uh, by saying that the view of this uh, collection of parties can be simulated by their collective input and outputs. So we will alternatively look at this collection of parties being corrupt together 
as an adversary going ahead and corrupting these parties and uh, trying to figure out the uh, the information about the remaining parties by looking at all their views together, collecting all of them. This is just for uh, ease of modeling purposes. So uh, uh, we'll consider two uh, behaviors of the adversary that are uh, studied most extensively. These are the semi-honest behavior and the malicious behavior. The semi-honest behavior is pretty much what we saw so far. Here, the corrupt parties, they still uh, stick to the protocol, but they will try to uh, infer the infer data about the remaining uncorrupted parties or the honest parties using uh, their collective view. Now, to show security against this kind of an adversary, we need to say that the view of uh, all the corrupted, par corrupted parties combined can be simulated using the inputs in using their inputs and outputs, like just we saw. Whereas uh, in the malicious setting, uh, the uh, the adversary is much more powerful. Uh, the corrupted the parties corrupted they can deviate arbitrarily from the protocol. In fact, they can uh, coordinatively uh, mount attacks in 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 a way to sabotage this protocol. So. Now, defining security is a slightly more um, defining security is a slightly more um, subtle thing to do. So, how do we uh, define security against a malicious adversary? We want to say that uh, our protocol is behaviorally equivalent to uh, the uh, ideal world uh, implementation. So. We will say that uh, the protocol is secure against an adversary if we can show an ideal adversary that runs that works in the uh, ideal implementation that has the same effect that the uh, the adversary in the real world in the protocol has uh, in the um, ideal uh, world. So formally, uh, we show security using a simulation argument. We say that a protocol pi computing f is secure against an adversary if there exists an ideal adversary i and a randomized uh, algorithm called a simulator such that the view of the adversary a in the protocol pi is indistinguishable from the view that is generated by the simulator by looking at the view of this ideal adversary i in the uh, ideal uh, world implementation. And if this uh, indistinguishability is perfect, then we say that uh, the security is perfect. If it is uh, uh, statistical, this indistinguishability, then we say that it's a statistically secure uh, protocol. And if this, this is a computational indistinguishability, then the protocol is said to be computationally secure. So now we can uh, go to the topic of this thesis which is MPC in the uh, setting where the connectivity is limited. So at this point, uh, if there is any question, I can uh, address them. Uh, otherwise, let me go ahead. So, uh, so the topic of this thesis is MPC when the network that is available for the parties to uh, conduct the uh, communication protocol is limited in connectivity. That is, there could be pairs of parties between which uh, the connection is only one directional, or there could be pairs of parties that cannot uh, talk to each other directly because they don't have uh, you know, communication network set up between them. So, okay. Uh, so uh, the our motivation to study this is fourfold. The first one is the, uh, fact that in real world, the networks that are available for you to run protocols are often incomplete. Secondly, uh, when it comes to two-party secure computation, uh, it is always advantageous to have the secure computation done with only one directional communication. So an obvious advantage would be that the two parties need not even be to present at the same time for this kind of a protocol to be run. And another thing is that uh, we can 
study uh, MPC in the limited connectivity. And this turns, uh, and it turns out that this yields tools that can be used in analyzing complexity of secure computation. Analyzing complexity of secure computation uh, has been found to be a hard task. Uh, in fact, the lower and upper bound of communication complexity of secure computation uh, has a uh, super exponential, super polynomial gap. And finally, uh, we <coughs> want to uh, model security in uh, communication models that are applied for uh, networks with limited connectivity. And we want to model security using the MPC way of uh, you know, defining security. So let me elaborate on each of these motivations and uh, informally describe the specific problems that we will be looking at in each of these directions. So first is limited connectivity in real networks. So when we try to implement uh, MPC protocols for various reasons in the real world, uh, one of the challenges would be that the network that we have available is uh, not complete. So uh, this motivates to study what, how we can do MPC in an incomplete network. So another motivation is that uh, from a theoretical standpoint, most of the work that goes on into MPC with a few exceptions, uh, uh, take complete networks by default. So, so in this uh, work, we uh, ask the question uh, that given a potentially incomplete network and a pair of parties in this network, when can these parties with the help of the rest of the parties in this network, uh, carry out secure computation of any function that they want, that is general secure computation, when can they carry it out? The second motivation was two-party computation with one-way communication. So as I mentioned, uh, one-way communication to do secure computation has several advantages. Uh, so in the 2015 paper, Garg Ishai et al. introduced this model called one-way secure computation uh, over noisy channels. Here, the noise in the channel is exploited to realize security uh, while constraining the communication to be just one directional along this uh, given channel, noisy channel. And the main question of interest here is what channels are complete in the setting? That is, what channels can we use in this one way secure computation model to compute any function that we want securely? And uh, we address uh, several problems that were left open uh, by this paper uh, in this work. So another, uh, the, the next motivation was analyzing complexity of secure computation. So as I mentioned, commun communication complexity of secure computation, uh, we, we, know, we don't know much about uh, uh, this complexity. So uh, we are going to use limited communication models to study complexity of secure computation. Our work is uh, inspired by uh, Kernidis et al's uh, 20, 12 paper that used uh, this zero communication protocols to study the communication complexity of non-secure computation. So we will uh, define uh, this notion of zero communication reductions and its secure variance. And then we'll show that this, uh, this model ties up nicely with several other uh, cryptographic primitives and we'll use these connections to obtain up upper and lower bounds for their uh, complexity. Finally, uh, we'll be modeling security uh, in communication models. So, so several communication models that are studied extensively in information theory, when they're when they are being implemented, uh, security concerns uh, show up and we need to redesign these uh, communication models to incorporate security. So in this direction, several works have looked at uh, secure versions of uh, index coding, coded caching, uh, distributed detection, and so on. In this uh, work, we looked at uh, uh, 
a private index coding. This is uh, index coding with the extra guarantee that uh, the, the user's data is not going to be uh, leaked to the rest of the users that are partaking in uh, uh, the index coding scheme. So to do this, we will use uh, pre-shared secret keys to, uh, you know, uh, to realize uh, security in this model. So now let me go into each of uh, these uh, directions and briefly describe the results that we have. So first we look at two-party computation in incomplete networks. A seminal work from the 1988 showed that in incomplete networks with n parties, that's an n party incomplete network, in a complete network with n parties, uh, any function can be computed with perfect information theoretic security as long as the number of corrupt parties is less than n by 2. By this, I mean that it's secure against an adversary that corrupts at most n by 2 minus 1 uh, parties in the network, less than n by 2 parties in the network, as long as the adversary is immune. So when the adversary is uh, malicious, then we have perfect security as long as the number of corrupt parties is strictly less than n by 3. But as I mentioned, most of the studies uh, that followed this uh, also looked at uh, in complete networks. So the question uh, of what happens in the incomplete networks uh, remains uh, we, remained very much open. So uh, we will look at the following question. We have a network, a potentially incomplete network uh, with, uh, let's say, n parties in it. And uh, there are two special uh, parties, A and B. And we would like to know whether A and B can securely compute any function that they want in this uh, n size network with the help of the remaining parties. The remaining parties do not have inputs or output. They're like basically helpers. The only people with an input and output will be A and B. And now we would like to do this. Uh, we, we are asking this question in the information theoretic setting, the security that we require is information theoretic. And we will consider both the semi-honest and uh, malicious adversaries. Uh, <clears throat> so it turns out that we, it is sufficient to look at a simpler problem. That is whether A and B can securely compute a specific function functionality called oblivious transfer in the given n size network. So, uh, so what is oblivious transfer? Uh, the oblivious transfer between in the oblivious transfer between A and B, A has a pair of bits as input x zero and x one, and B has a single bit B as input, and B gets the output X sub B, whereas A does not receive any output. This is the oblivious transfer. It turns out that uh, oblivious transfer is complete for secure two-party computation. That is in the semi-honest setting, uh, if A and B can securely realize oblivious transfer, then they can compute any two-party function securely. And in the malicious setting, it's slightly more limited. They can do, they can compute any function that has output only at one party. So uh, we characterize the networks in which A and B can achieve OT uh, with T security. By T security, I mean that the adversary, we, we have security against the adversary that corrupts at most T parties in the network. Note that there are N parties in the network. Uh, the rest of them other than A and B are helpers. So we show that there are two conditions which are necessary and sufficient. The first condition is a simple one. It says that A and B should be able to communicate T securely. And the second condition is a slightly more complicated one. But the necessity of the first condition is coming from the fact that if you can do oblivious transfer, then you can clearly communicate with each other securely. The second condition uh, is basically a consequence of the fact that two parties cannot simply sit and talk with each other and realize oblivious transfer securely. So if the condition two is broken, then realizing OT over such a network would imply uh, such a protocol for OT between two parties. So we show that this, uh, these conditions are not only necessary, but also sufficient. Uh, and the 
we construct a protocol for realizing OT using OT combiners. And the protocols that we construct are efficient for the values of T that are small or large in terms of N. Now, since OT is complete in the semi on a setting, we have a strong corollary for this. We can characterize the networks in which a given set of parties can compute any function with T security. This is possible if and only if every pair of parties in this set can uh, set satisfies the conditions in theorem one. Now, uh, we also characterize uh, the networks where OT can be done with T security in the malicious setting. Note that here the security that we are guaranteeing is statistical. And here also we have two conditions that turn out to be necessary and sufficient. The first condition is similar to the previous one. It says that A and B should be able to communicate T securely. The second condition is uh, related to the fact that um, <clears throat> A and B cannot compute OT securely, even with the help of one extra helper in the malicious setting. Previously, the impossibility was coming from the fact that two parties cannot compute OT securely by simply talking to each other. Here it is a stronger condition. We show that uh, we show this necessary condition by using a, an argument uh, that follows the route that uh, Fisher et al. used to show that uh, Byzantine agreement is impossible amongst three parties. Now, the sufficiency of this uh, scheme is also uh, shown with a protocol that uses OT combiners. Now, um, yeah, but uh, note that this does not give us a, as strong a co corollary as the previous one. And in fact, in a later work, we showed that, uh, or rather, we later showed that uh, in the malicious adversary setting, A and B can indeed compute any function uh, over the network with T security if these two conditions are satisfied. So. To show this, we used a different kind of protocol, which uses virtual party simulation and uh, detectable pre-computed broadcast. So uh, in conclusion, let me also note that uh, our results actually do extend to general adversary structures. So two open problems uh, in this uh, direction where, uh, one is that we have not really characterized uh, the networks for perfect security in the malicious setting. And uh, the second one is that we do not have a network characterization for a set of parties instead of just two parties in the malicious case. Okay, so let me now move on to the one-way secure computation. So one the, question though. Yes, yeah. So how does efficiency scale with the T? like for, for the, the positive results? So uh, in the semi honest setting, uh, the, so it, it's polynomial in T. So for small values of T, it is efficient, but we also show that when T is like N minus constant in that region also things are efficient, but we do not have that kind of an efficiency for large values of T in the malicious setting. So, so basically what we will have in all, all our protocols are secure in the size of the adversary structure. Okay. So uh, now uh, let me move on to one-way secure computation. Uh, this model was introduced by Gargeta in the 2015 paper. So we will also abbreviate one-way secure computation as OWSC. So the objective of one-way secure computation is to securely compute a function with uh, just one way co communication over a given noisy channel. So because the communication is one directional, uh, it does not, it makes sense only to talk about secure computation of those functions in which the sender has uh, an input and the receiver has an output, but the sender does not have an output or the receiver does not have an input. Uh, so we will call these sender receiver functionalities. So now, uh, because of the one directionality of uh, communication, uh, OWSCs have a simple protocol. So what, what is an OWSC scheme for uh, F over a, a functionality F over a uh, channel C look like? So the sender has an input A to this function F, 
and the receiver wants the output f of a. So uh, again, note that uh, yeah, it, this problem becomes interesting only when f is mostly when f is uh, uh, randomized, as we will see soon. So the protocol involves the sender encoding uh, their input s a using a encoding scheme and then sending it over the channel, potentially making several uses of the channel. And the receiver takes the output of the channel Y and then runs their decoder R to compute the function F of A. Now, what are the security concerns? We want to ensure that the sender does not learn what the receiver's output is, except for the fact that it is uh, distributed according to F of A. So now if F is deterministic in the uh, information theoretic setting, there is nothing much to hide. Uh, but if it is random, then we have something to hide. So um, the security against the receiver requires that the receive the 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 view of the receiver, which in which includes only the uh, which can consists of only the output of the channel. This does not receive uh, this this does not reveal anything more than the specific output that the receiver is uh, decoding. So this. Uh, makes it impossible. I mean, so this makes the problem uh, interesting because now the sender cannot simply uh, send their input over this channel using say a, an error correction code because that would break the security against the receiver because the receiver knows the entire input. Also, the sender cannot compute the function themselves and send it over to the uh, receiver because that would breach the security against sender. So, um, so yeah, the uh, formally the security is defined by saying that the uh, the correctness and privacy against the sender requires that the uh, encoding of the message and the output of the receiver this is distributed closely to uh, the um, encoding of the sender and the output of the receiver. Oh, sorry, the, the encoding of the sender and the output of the functionality on this particular input. And uh, privacy against the receiver requires that there exists a simulator that simulates the view of the receiver from just the output of the receiver, that is F of A, given the correctness. That is, yeah. so, um, so from a theoretical point, standpoint, uh, this problem is interesting because in a sense, it. Uh, it's it's uh, talking about the secure computing capability of the noisy channel, uh, but from a, a practical scenario, from a practical standpoint, also it has several applications. So first of all, uh, most of the I mean several cryptographic tasks can be modeled as uh, sender receiver functionalities. And this particular model lets you uh, realize these functionalities with, with just one round of I mean, with just one uh, directional communication, making it uh, possible for the two parties to be not present together at the same time and so on. Also, uh, zero knowledge proofs uh, realized in this model uh, are truly non-interactive and in that it does not even use a trusted common randomness to uh, uh, realize uh, these proofs. Also, uh, we can use one-way secure computation to generate, to generate uh, random puzzles, uh, which does not give uh, any advantage to even to the, the person who generated the puzzle or the person who is trying to solve them. Uh, because of the security of the scheme. Uh, other notable uh, applications are realizing blind signatures, uh, which will have applications in eCache and for uh, realizing non-interactive uh, certified PKI generation. Varun, I have so, a question. So yeah. how is blind signatures uh, modeled? So, uh, so by blind signatures here, we mean the following sender receiver functionality in which the sender has a certain input 
And what the receiver is going to get is this input concatenated with some randomness signed with the sender's uh, signature. So now, uh, so the specific kind of eCash that we are talking about is where the issuer of the currency uh, <clears throat> uh, issues a certain uh, note, but the specific identity of the note will not be known to the issuer because it has been random. The serial number on the note will be randomized but it is valid because it is signed by the issuer of this currency. So it does not capture the traditional bank signature where yeah, yeah, I agree, uh, I agree. Yeah. receiver has a message and the signer has a message. Yes, yeah. So over here, the receiver does not have a message. The, the message itself is getting generated randomly. So it, it's in the specific sense we meant bank signature. Okay. So uh, in this work, we uh, address several uh, questions that have been, uh, we extend and generalize several, quest several questions that were addressed in the uh, Gargetals paper. In the 2015 paper, they showed that uh, the binary erasure channel and binary symmetric channel are not complete for one-way secure computation with negligible error. We uh, extend this result and show that in fact, no finite channel is complete for one-way secure computation uh, with uh, negligible error. Also, previously it was shown that uh, the class of string ROTs of uh, larger and larger lengths is indeed com complete for one-way secure computation with negligible error. So let me describe what completeness means. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. Well, maybe. Maybe. Uh... Maybe I'll wait for you to describe it because, like, it's it's not clear to me what, what do you mean by complete. Uh... Yes, yeah. So, what do we mean by completeness? So, a channel C is said to be complete in this model if I can use that channel to uh, compute any function that I want uh, in this model. So, any function by which we mean any sender receiver functionality uh, that we want, we can compute it using a channel. Then we call that. When we say, then we say that that channel is complete. So, so just, just uh, small comment. I, yeah. I think that this is you know this is a, a valuable uh, notion, but I think that the name complete like the term completeness is kind of uh, I, I don't think that it's appropriate for this in this context. Uh, uh, you uh -huh. know because in a sense you are saying nothing is complete. So 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 you know the notion of completeness is is broken, right? I mean. Oh, no, I mean, uh, we will show that certain channels are complete. Okay. Ah, you say, okay, sorry. Okay, I missed it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good, good, good. So, uh, I mean, so in the 15 paper, they showed that not a single channel, but this class of channels, string ROT, is complete in the, the sense that I mentioned in the one-way secure computation model. So what is a string ROT? It is a randomized version of the string oblivious transfer that the oblivious transfer is the oblivious transfer that we saw previously. In string ROT, uh, the sender will have a pair of strings as input of some prescribed length, and the receiver will get one of these strings uniformly at random, while the other, is, uh, other string gets erased. So, uh, in, 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 uh, so we show that, uh, in fact, there are uh, complete channels if we are ready to settle for not negligible, but inverse polynomial error. Specifically, the bit ROT channel. This is the ROT channel in which the sender's input is a pair of bits. Uh, bit ROT channel is complete in the one-way secure computation setting. So, so, so just to understand, so you're allowed yeah. to use this, to reuse the channels many times? That, that's the point? Yes, yes, yeah. In, in the scheme, uh, the sender will be encoding their input. Uh, and they will be, so this encoding itself could be like many, I mean, it'll be like many alphabets and then many symbols. And then you would potentially use many, uh, you make many uses of this channel to send the encoding through. Good, good. thank you. Yeah. So, um, so, so in, the, in the previous work, they also showed that uh, zero knowledge functionality can be realized over the binary erasure channel and binary symmetric channel. Uh, these are simple channels. So binary erasure channel erases the input with some probability and symmetry channel flips the input with, the prob with some probability when the input is a bit. So we show that uh, 
indeed we can characterize the channels that can realize zero knowledge in the uh, one way secure model in fact we show that except for some trivial channels all the channels can be used for realizing zero knowledge so let me uh, describe the main results so uh, so we show that uh, there is an owc protocol uh, using the rot channel bit rot channel that makes n uses of the bit rot channel and realizes an n to the delta minus half uh, secure string rot of length n to the delta so we can get an n to the 1/4 sized string rot with a probability with with security error that is n to the minus 1 by 4 it's in this sense that it is inverse polynomial so what we have realized is a uh, string rot of large enough length as long a length as you need using the uh, the small bit rot channel that you had but now the previous like i mentioned the previous results show that the class of string rot channels of larger and larger length is complete as a consequence this theorem has a corollary that bit rot channels are indeed complete with inverse polynomial error in this owc model so we construct this bit rot channel uh, to uh, string rot uh, uh, channel owc scheme using this notion of average case ram secret sharing so <clears throat> so it's it's an n parity secret sharing where the secret size is polynomial in n it's like n to the 1/4 let's say and each share size is a single bit but we can obtain a, a reconstruction threshold of uh n plus n to the delta by 2 and the secrecy threshold of n minus n to the delta by 2 so this is like the the gap is something that is uh, n to the 1/4 but uh, here of course the uh, secrecy and reconstruction guarantees are average in the average case and uh, we can use this kind of a secret sharing scheme to realize uh, uh the the specific owc protocol that we need by uh observing by e- exploiting the anti concentration around the mean of a binomial distribution so yeah it's an interesting construction that uh, you could take a look at so the construction is similar to uh, lin cherak ji et al's uh, construction from uh, their 2015 paper so the second result i'd like to highlight is Yeah. yeah. Can't you just use a random random code with the appropriate uh, rate for for these kind of things to get the secret sharing uh, scheme? So um, secrecy would be so a random linear code would not guarantee secrecy uh, because I mean uh, yeah I mean why not? You have enough entropy, right? I mean you have enough. Uh... I mean never mind if you. Didn't... Yeah, I mean. Yeah, so I mean, so you so can the, get a random secret sharing from a random linear code in a direct way. Maybe uh, I'm not sure what 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 you get with the LCG plus uh, paper. Probably you get additional features. So, so what LCG plus does is uh, it realizes a, a secret sharing scheme with share size one bit and secret size n to the delta. But the reconstruction threshold would be uh, so. So the gap would be linear in n. Uh, rather than this inverse polynomial so uh, yeah i mean the, uh, the the specific question that you mentioned i i can take this offline and let you know okay sure so so uh so our the second result i'd like to highlight is uh saying that we can realize the zero knowledge proof of knowledge functionality over the one way secure computation model using any non trivial channel so what do we mean by a non trivial channel it's a channel that does not uh, split into a completely noisy component and a completely clear component as long as the chan- the, the noise is meaningful we can use it to uh, get uh, zero knowledge so uh, this construction happens in two steps first we use uh, a non trivial channel to realize a noisy erasure channel uh and then use this noisy erasure channel to realize the zero knowledge uh functionality 
So the noisy erasure channel, we want to realize uh, with the following guarantees, that is, we want it to be secure uh, when the sender follows the protocol. That is, we need security against the receiver when the sender follows the protocol. And when the sender does not follow the protocol, uh, we want the receiver to uh, detect it over like several uses of the channel, several uses of the channel where the sender misbehaves. So to construct this kind of a uh, uh, noisy channel using the given channel, we exploit the geometric interpretation of the channel to get the right kind of statistical test that will let the receiver detect this kind of misbehavior. And in the second, st the second step is rather straightforward and uh, it can be realized using known techniques. So next, let me, uh, so could you tell me how many, how much more time I have? Maybe 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. Oh, I see. So, okay. So uh, next we look at some uh, results in the one-way secure computation model itself, uh, which, which, which uh, deals with computational security. So as we already discussed, there are uh, families of string ROT channels that are complete with negligible error. And this bit ROT channel, which is secure, which is complete with inverse polynomial error. So one question that was left open was whether there are natural channels, like channels like binary symmetric channel and erasure channel, which model all the many of the natural uh, noises. Uh, whether these kind of channels are complete in the OWSC model, and the the 2015 paper actually showed that uh, the string ROT. Uh, I mean, showed that BC and BSC are not complete uh, as long as we restrict to uh, a certain kind of protocols that, that, that we call Las Vegas protocol. These are, these are protocols in which the receiver knows whenever they are making an error. So in these kind of protocols, we know that BC and BSC uh, are incomplete in, in a strong sense that we cannot get e even a small enough security error using arbitrarily many making even when we are making arbitrary many uses of the channel. So this roots in this uh, fact that uh, ROT has a certain anti-correlation to it. That is uh, when the receiver gets one of the two strings that are sent by the sender, the other string is uh, erased and this is happening uniformly at random. So the re revealing of one string uh, erases the other string. So this is the anti-correlation, but neither the BEC nor the BSC has an inherent anti-correlation of this kind. So in this work, we realize this anti-correlation uh, uh, using OWC's uh, protocol over the BEC uh, and ideal obfuscation. So by ideal obfuscation, we mean an, a certain idealization of the obfuscation functionality. So a user with uh, access to a, um, obfuscation of the function of a, of a certain function can query this function on polynomially many uh, inputs, but uh, the, and only receive just the output of these functions and learn nothing else about the function. So we show that when we uh, use uh, ideal obfuscation, string ROT can be realized over the binary erasure channel with uh, inverse polynomial error, uh, against a, uh, in fact, a computationally unbounded sender and a query bounded in that they can query this ideal obfuscation only polynomially many times, but otherwise computationally unbounded a receiver. So, um, so yeah, I don't think I have time to describe the specific uh, protocol, but uh, so what does it, what does uh, one-way secure computation using ideal obfuscation look like? Uh, so basically the sender not only sends an encoding of, the, uh, of their input over the channel, but the sender is also allowed to prepare a function f that depends on the input and the encoding that they have sent. And this prepared function can be communicated over to the receiver as an, as an ideal obfuscation. So the receiver can now use both the output of the channel, Y1 to YN, and also this ideal obfuscation to decode the message. So we essentially come up with a uh, 
function f uh, that basically exploits the um, anti-concentration around the mean of the binomial distribution to uh, realize some kind of an anti-correlation, which uh, is required for the ROT. So this is also an interesting uh, construction that uh, is, yeah, that you can take a look at. So in the one-way secure computation model, our main open problems are, one is to characterize channels that are complete in the inverse polynomial with in inverse polynomial error. We just showed that ROT is complete with in information theoretic security and uh, BC and BSC are complete when we are using ideal obfuscation, but the, the more general question still remains. The, the, yeah, in, in this ideal obfuscation model, the main open problem is whether we can instantiate the ideal obfuscation in the plane uh, model. And another rather uh, yeah, uh, difficult question that we came across is whether we can show that the binary erasure channel uh, can be, whether we can prove that the binary erasure channel is not complete in the uh, one-way secure computation model. Note that the Gargetta's paper already showed that they are incomplete as long as we stick to uh, this Las Vegas kind of protocols, but generally can we show that uh, these channels are not complete? Our intuition is that it is not, but it turns out to be quite difficult to show. So uh, let me move on to the uh, next topic that is zero communication reductions. In uh, cryptography, we use several information theoretic primitives like uh, secret sharing, uh, conditional disclosure of secrets or CDS, uh, private simultaneous messages or PSM and so on. So these, uh, these primitives are easy to define and they, uh, they capture the essence of certain cryptographic problems and they help in coming up with interesting uh, cryptographic constructions. So in this work, we introduce uh, a new information theoretic primitive called zero communication reductions. It's a bare-bone uh, model for two-party secure computation. We then connect this model to uh, several other primitives like CDS, PSM, and two-party computation. Uh, and via this connection obtain upper and lower bounds. So our con contribution here is threefold. One is we define zero communication reductions with varying levels of security, and then using the uh, connections that we make with PSM, CDS, and secure two-party computation, we obtain new upper bounds. Our upper bounds are of the statistical kind, and we obtain it via ZCR constructions. So <clears throat> we show that the uh, complexity of uh, <coughs> computing the PSM of a function f I mean, PSM in the P, uh, computing a function f in the PSM model uh, is at most exponential in the information theoretic complexity of uh, information complexity of this function f. So we do this via constructing first a ZCR. The ZCR itself is built uh, in in term using the using the relaxed partition of the said function. And then we connect the relaxed partition number with the information complexity of the function uh, using the result by Karenidis et al. from the 2012 paper. So this way we get the said upper bound. And in the other direction, we show that uh, a secure variant of the zero communication reductions uh, that we uh, define uh, is connected with two-party secure computation in the sense that if we get a lower bound for the complexity of this secure ZCR, uh, that implies a uh, that implies a lower bound for the complexity of two-party uh, computation. By complexity, I mean the OT complexity, the number of OTs that are going to be used by the secure two-party computation. So uh, the OT complexity of two-party computation has been a, a difficult problem. Uh, because it is connected to the uh, circuit complexity and uh, complexity of private information retrieval and so on. And the best known lower bound is by Beemel and Malkin from the, from the 20, uh, 
2004 paper. Uh, so we recover this uh, lower bound uh, using the secure ZCR. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we use only certain aspects of the uh, secure ZCR to obtain this lower bound. We hope that by uh, exploiting more properties of the secure ZCR um, while lower bounding its complexity, uh, we can actually get a stronger lower bound for the OT complexity. For this, we capture the complexity of the uh, ZCR, secure ZCR, using, a, using an, a linear algebraic quantity called the invertible rank. So uh, the, the complexity of the secure ZCR of a function f uh, can be described in terms of the invertible rank of that function f, which is an algebraic quantity. And we uh, hope that in, in further work, we can show that this quantity uh, is uh, super polynomial for some function. At least we can show the existence of this kind of a function, which would imply, uh, which would imply um, super polynomial OT complexity. So let me briefly describe what uh, ZCR is. It's a rather minimal uh, way of function computation. So the zero communication reduction of a function f to a predicate phi uh, works as follows. Um, so Alice and Bob with uh, inputs X and Y respectively will compute a candidate output for themselves, that is A and B respectively in this uh, diagram, and also uh, generate uh, an input to the predicate phi. So Alice generates U and Bob generates V. Now, uh, the non-triviality condition uh, requires that for any input X comma Y, the, the predicate accepts with probability that is non-zero. So if, if the probability is at least two to the minus mu for every pair of inputs, then we say that the ZCR is mu ZCR. And the correctness condition that we want is that, uh, <clears throat> yeah, whenever the predicate accepts the candidate outputs of this Alice and Bob, they are correct. That is A comma B is equal to F of X, Y when the decision is one. So this is along the, the this uh, is a generalization or basically a secure version of the zero communication protocols that Kerendis et al used to actually show the, the, the bound on the relax, relaxed partition in terms of information complexity. So uh, yeah, so we define three variations of this uh, with varying levels of security in in vanilla ZCR, there is no uh, security constraint. In the weak ZCR, we want security against an adversary who is seeing just the output of this uh, predicate, the decision. So, so we want to ensure that for every pair of inputs, X comma Y, the, the decision, uh, the probability with which the decision is one is the same. This is to hide uh, which pair of inputs happen. And in the secure ZCR, the adversary could not only corrupt the output of, I mean, not only see the output of the uh, uh, predicate, it can also see uh, the view. It, it also has access to the view of, let's say, Alice or uh, Bob. So, so we will uh, require a um, simulation kind of argument to show the impossible to show the security uh, in in this particular model, and it is in this model that we obtain the lower bounds for uh, OT complexity. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, these three variants, the ZCR, the weak ZCR, and secure ZCR, are combinatorially uh, simpler than. Uh, a uh, two-party protocol, which will have several rounds of communication with each other and so on. Over here, there is no communication and it's just one round of uh, sending messages through to the predicate. So we showed connections uh, of these models with CDS, PSM and OT complexity, using which we obtain upper bounds 
in terms of the information complexity and in the, in, in, in the direction of lower bounds, we uh, came up with this uh, algebraic quantity called the invertible rank, which we leave as an open problem to show is uh, uh, it can be really large for some functions. So finally, uh, we look at private index coding. So let me describe what index coding is. Here there is a server uh, and n users. And the server okay, yeah. And the server has n messages, x1 to xn. And each user i requires the message xi. But the the user has access to some side information that will be like xj's for several j's which are not equal to i. Now, the challenge in index coding is to come up with the shortest broadcast that you can make with which all the users will get what uh, the, the message that they want. Now, uh, several models of privacy have been studied in the index coding model, uh, in, in the index coding setting. So many of them deal with security against an eavesdropper, that a third, a, another party that is eavesdropping on the broadcast. Uh, but we uh, are interested in ensuring security across the users. So another direction that was looked at by some other works are like hiding the side information structure from each other and so on. But here we want to ensure that any user learns only what only the side information that they already have and the specific message that they want. The user I wants the message XI, right? So it does not learn anything more than its own side information and the specific message that they want. We uh, try to, rea we, we realize this by uh, setting up uh, secret keys among uh, these users. So, so uh, this is to say that, so how do we describe privacy in the setting? We want to say that uh, the scheme is private against a user i if the mutual information between the set of all messages that is x1 to xn that I've written as x2 x superscript n, the mutual information between xn and the transmitted message m uh, conditioned on uh, the files that the user i wants, that is xi, and the files that the user i already has, uh, these are the side information si, and also the keys that are available at the user i. So these are all the, uh, all the information that the user i will have by the end of the protocol. So we want to ensure that given all these, uh, this information, the transmission does not reveal any more extra information about uh, the rest of the files. So we want this mutual information to go to zero, uh, yeah, to ensure privacy. So we first address the question of feasibility, that is in what ways can we distribute the secret keys to ensure that we can realize uh, index coding? Uh, as long as we are allowed to use uh, unlimited amount of keys uh, with respect to this particular uh, key distribution or key structure. And our first theorem characterizes uh, the key access structures under which uh, private index coding is feasible. Post uh, feasibility, the main quantity of interest here is the rate of private index coding. The rate of privacy index coding is a two to the n uh, dimensional quantity. So two to the n minus one dimensional quantity. So uh, there is the rate of transmission in the index coding and the rate of cons con consumption of each key. I mean, so for consider a subset S, uh, so there, 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 there is a key that is going to be shared amongst the users in the set S and the server. And we can talk about how much of, in what, at what rate are those keys being consumed? So, so the rate of index coding is this two to the n minus one dimensional keys, uh, two to the n dimensional object. Uh, and we are interested in uh, what rates can we achieve, like the rate region of uh, the private index coding. So we first show that having private uh, randomness or common randomness 
uh, in this scheme, uh, it does not make any difference. Like using private randomness or common randomness uh, does not affect the, uh, the rate. By private randomness, I mean the randomness that is private to just the sender. So, uh, so we address this rate question and we show that uh, up to three users, uh, we can completely characterize the rate region. Uh, and the rates can be, every rate in this rate region can be achieved using scalar codes. Further, we show that in, in the four user instances, there are certain rates that cannot be achieved using scalar codes and we need to resort to vector coding for it. We also show that more generally for any uh, number of users, uh, we can get a polymetroidal uh, outer bound for the rate. And this can be thought of as a generalization of the polymetroidal outer brown bound in the uh, non-private index coding uh, setting. Further, we also study the rate at which the keys are consumed in total. That is the total number of keys that are going to be consumed. And we show that this has to be at least the transmission rate of the index code. So in, in the specific sense, there is some, some kind of a uh, one-time pad kind of nature to uh, the scheme. So over here, uh, some of the open problems uh, that are notable are, uh, so firstly, we could not show that uh, private randomness is not useful when we talk about perfect privacy. So that information quantity that we previously saw, if we equate it to zero, then in that situation, we cannot show that private randomness is useless. Uh, further, there is a question of whether the whether we can trade off the total use of the keys with the transmission rate uh, of the index coding. That is, can we use, uh, I mean, yeah, so when we, can we use more keys in order to reduce the rate of uh, uh, transmission? And we also would like to see some uh, cases where nonlinear uh, index codes do better than uh, linear private index codes. This kind of results are available in the non-private index coding. So it might be interesting to see if the similar a, a similar phenomena happens in the private index coding also. And yeah, that is that is all. These are the uh, publications that is part of this thesis. Uh, and thank you. And uh, we can take questions uh, from the audience uh, before we move to the uh, first part of the events. So if there are any quick questions, please go ahead. Okay, so it looks like we don't have unless I miss something. Uh, so in that case, uh, we come to the end of the public uh, uh, part of this uh, defense.